Welcome to Full Current. No, we have current now waiting. Now, Full Current. From Ebutemeta to Etiosa. <laughs> Banky has done it all. <laughs> Banky has done it all. From music to movies to politics to being an MOG. <laughs> We've done it all. Thank God. Honored to have you here, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, for please, me. what's the full name? Is it, is it Banky W? What's, what's the full name? My full name is Olubankole Wellington. But if you want the middle names too, yes. it's Olubankole Olushegun Ayodeji Omojola <laughs> Paul Umo Wellington. Umo is my ethic name. Who's ethic? My mom. My Who's ethic? Yes. She's oh, wow. Calabar. Can you cook? Very well, actually. Yeah, I'm the chef in my house. One day you'll come. You one and day, madam, no, you'll come for we'll dinner. Come. We'll, eh? we'll one day you'll come and try it for yourself. <laughs> so you cook? I do. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a good... I, I think I'm a good cook, and, um, and I'm really into food. So I even co-own a restaurant, okay. obviously, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you so, so you're, fo you're foodie? Yeah, 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 fully. Pepe, pepe. 100%. Pepe, is, it, is, it, is pepe your thing? It, it is, but within reason. You know, I'm not <laughs> trying to burn my tongue in the process, but, yeah, I'm, I'm into spice. So yeah. I, I, I heard of Banky, like, years ago, and it was from a video, I think, I think on the video, you wore your cap, Back, did you make a cap on that video, a Buta Meta video? Probably. Did, did you wear, I think you even wore it backwards, I remember. And yeah. I've, you've put on artists, you've been the guy. Okay. AME, AME was like, <laughs> was like, it was like, hover and, ah. <laughs> and now people talk about you and Christianity. Yeah. So, so, so I want to ask this question. This God thing, did it start because of like a trial, health issue? Mm. Did it start because of wahala? Or right. were, you, were you always a God person? How, how did it start, this your new God um, association? Okay, so for me, um, my journey with God didn't start in recent years. It actually started from when I was a kid. Okay. So my mom is actually, as we speak, my mom is a pastor in a redeemed church in the United States. So, you know, from a, I can't remember how old I was, but she got born again very, fairly early before the rest of us and even before my dad. And so she kind of put us, you know, I was a church boy. You were know, a church boy too? Full church boy. Full Are you serious? Boy. I was the youngest in the church choir in Fountain of Life Church. Um, big shout out to Pastor Taiwo wow. Udukoya, who has recently transitioned. Wow. Um, but, I, you know, I was, I was a full church boy, you know, midweek service, Sunday service, choir practice, musical group, drama department, all, Are you serious? everything. Um, and so I think the foundations for my relationship with God were laid at that time. But sometimes when I'm talking to people, I say, um, you guys know the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, yeah. right? I tell people, you can just remove prodigal son and put my name there. Because that was my story. Um, in essence, I grew up um, having a, a keen sense of awareness about who God is and the fact that, you know, he was in me and he was my backbone. But somewhere along the way, you know, you, you make a, a couple of decisions, you take, take on some suggestions, and before you know it, you put one foot in front of the other, and you wake up one day and you realize that you're not who you were supposed to be. And... Um, I think in the eyes of the world, you can look successful and maybe even be successful to a certain measure. But you know, there's a reason that billionaires commit suicide. It's because when the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? It's a thing, eh? It's a thing because what, what people find, especially successful people, what they find is that when you've chased success and chased money and whatever it is that you're chasing, and you attain some measure of it, and then you still realize that you've come up short, that something is missing. Um, I learned that it's really not money that we are chasing. We're chasing meaning, not money. And it is in, in that chase for meaning, and you, you, you kind of get misguided, and you, you know, step outside of purpose, and you go one way or another. Um, so, you know, back in, I think, 20. 14, 2015, I, I just had this sense of wretchedness inside of me. Um, and when I'm talking to young people today, I say there's a God-shaped void inside of every man. And you can try to fill it with money, 
Wait, with but, girls, but, is, it, is, it, is, with this, is it true? Drugs, with partying, party. you can feel it with anything that you want, but until you start feeling it with God, you will still come up short. So you, you know still what? come up empty. In, in, in that your fame, because in that your fame, you're still famous, you're still banky. Right. But in that season of, of like being everywhere, touring the world, yeah. UK, did you were you empty sincerely? Just don't. You? No, I, I definitely was. I mean, it got to the point where I was battling with so many things inside of me, and that juxtaposition, that contradiction between kind of sort of being successful but inside feeling empty and feeling low and feeling um, not worth anything. And um, it got to the point where one day I said, you know what, no matter how bad I'm living, I must be in church on Sunday morning just to try and find something, something that I was missing. And I started, at the time, I mean, I'd, at the time I'd recently moved into Lucky Phase 1, so I started looking for a church. And, you know, I went to visit a couple of churches, and I didn't really find it. And then one day I went to TPH with Pastor Tony Rappel. And um, I remember the first day I went, I kind of enjoyed the service, but it was a guest speaker, and it didn't really do much for me. So I was like, this is not the place. So, I, I, you know, I went home saying I'll find somewhere else. And then something came and said, well, you didn't see the main Gosh. pastor preach. Just go back again when he's speaking and just see. And... You know, I kind of looked, and the, the next time that PT was speaking, I went back in, you know, to visit the church. And it was like, it was almost like there was nobody else in the room, and he was just talking to me. And, you know, I brought out my phone, and I was, you know, scribbling notes down, and, and I was watching him so intently. And it was almost like, for the first time in years, somebody was talking to the part of me that nobody sees. And I, I still wasn't, you know kind of back with God. But you know, it takes a long journey to get to where you are. So it also takes a long journey to, to make back, it back. Yeah. So um, it just started like that. I just started making sure that I could be in the club on Saturday night till three, four o'clock in the morning. But you see that Sunday morning, you go there. I'll go there. especially if PT was preaching, I would go there and I would sit and I would just listen to the word of God. And it started to open my heart back up. I, I started to feel like me again. And this was around 2014, 2015. No, 2014, actually. It was 2014. And the more that I started taking those steps, it's, it's like the story of the prodigal son. Gradually. You know, once you begin the journey, the Bible says the father saw the son a long way off and, and, and came out to meet him and hug him and kissed him, even in that dirty, just came out of a pigsty state. And that's what it felt like for me. It was like God just came to meet me where I was with all of my issues, with all of the problems, with all the sin and struggles that I had been battling with for a long time. And God just came to meet me there and just hugged me and started leading me back. And, you know, from PT, you know, I started discovering other men of God, Pastor Stephen Chandler in the States. Um, I started listening to... Uh, uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes. But Steve did you have Furtick to lose friends to get new friends or you were wise about it? So I would say that the people who I consider close friends um, till today are still close friends. Um, that's, that's, but I think... That's, that's good. Yes, yes. Um, but I think that there comes a period where there are certain places that because of what you know God is doing with you, the question you ask yourself is, is this wise for me, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Is this wisdom, right? So maybe back in the day, it was okay to just, you know, be in the club or be in the strip club or wherever. But because of the journey that I was on, there were certain places that I just couldn't go to anymore. And that does something to friendships. Um, Maybe not particularly your close friends, because the people that are really close with you, generally speaking, will go on some level of the journey with, with you. you yeah. But, you know, that circle of people that you kind of turn up with and you're out and just, you know, have living that life with, um, it definitely alters those friendships. But for me, it was like I was, I was finally tasting freedom from some of the things that I had been battling with. And I didn't want to risk it by putting myself in situations that would, Again, would drag me back, back to where I was trying to escape from. 
you know, um, sometimes it's easier to flee temptation than to fight it. So I don't want to be in an environment that would present that. certain things that would, you know, kind of lull me back into where I was trying to break free from. So it alters friendships, absolutely. There are some people that you wouldn't be as close with anymore um, that you were when you were living a certain way. And, but, you know, honestly, for me, it just... I got to the place where God became the priority, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I still pray and try and make sure that that still remains the case. But when God becomes the priority in your life, Nothing else is worth that anymore. So if you have to lose friends or success or uh, anything, you know, I remember, you know, so fast forward a few years, I started kind of teaching and preaching in church in Waterbrook in 2020. And, um, you know, the first few months of 2020 was the first few times I had started preaching regularly, maybe once a month. So it, 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 just that, in that season, yeah. Did you have self-judgment? Because you knew who you were. Oh, yeah. You, oh, you, 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 certainly. You, when you ever interested, you saw one of the girls coming and you have... Certainly. Jesus, <laughs> how did you cope? Okay, God. So, so the, so the, first, God, thing, the God. first thing that I should tell you is that... Um, so, the, you know, that, that was 2015, 2016. Um, by 2017, 2018, I was, I was starting to be, you know, kind of on the path where God wanted me yeah. to be. Um, so fast forward to 2020 now, when I started feeling the call of God so heavily to say, the more you reach, the more you teach. The more you know, the more you need to share with other people. Yeah. But like you said, I was in that place of self-judgment because I was like, who wants to hear about God <laughs> from the king of Lagos party? <laughs> like, who is even going to take me serious? You know, like, I'm the, I mean, I'm happy that God is fixing my life. But he needs to go and find somebody else <laughs> to do this stuff because I'm not qualified to be that guy. And I remember I struggled with a lot. So, so there were two things that God taught me. One is that, first of all, none of us are worthy. Um, and that two. God wow. sometimes picks the most unlikely candidates to use for his purposes. Um, so if you, if you even look throughout scripture... You know, Abraham was a liar. Uh, Lazarus was dead. Rahab was a prostitute. Uh, Moses was a stutterer. Noah was a drunkard. Like, Scripture is filled with people who, you know, according to men, don't qualify. You know, when God told Gideon he was a warrior, he was hiding, you know, just trying to survive and, you know, hiding from it. Let nobody see me. So, so I learned that, one, God likes to pick it's almost, it's almost his way. He picked Paul, who was killing Christians, to be the preeminent apostle of the New Testament. So, so one, I, I learned that God picks unlikely people. Then the second thing I learned is that the Bible does not mask the mistakes of great men. You know, we know that David was a king and, you know, he did so many epic things for God. But we also know that he was an adulterer. We know that he was a murderer. We know that his hands were bloody. That's why Peter. God didn't let him... I mean, Peter was Betrayed. vile. He, was, swore. he swore. He cursed, know you know. So, and I remember there was a, there was a time when, um, when the, the call to teach, and not only was God placing it on me, you know, PT, Pastor Bless, they were all trying to say, hey, you know, you're going to speak this Sunday. And I was just like, like what, you know. <laughs> and I, so I called my younger brother, Fumi, who lives in the States. And I said, you know, this and this is happening, but I don't know what to do. Like, do I go back and try and purge? Like, how do you purge the internet <laughs> of, you know, and that's not to say that I, I'm ashamed of my career, not at all. There's songs, beautiful love songs that I've written, you know, there's a lot of stuff to be proud of, but there were some times that I pushed the envelope too far. Um, and so I, I was speaking with Fumi about it, and I said, how, do you, how does one even purge? Because you know once you put something on the internet, it's, it's there. there. So it's like, how does one go back and, you know, scrub the internet of these things. And it was Fumi that told me, he said, you know, Banky, when you read the Bible, you, you see where the men made mistakes. Like, that's part of the testimony, is saying, I was lost, nice. but now I'm found, nice. and this is what got me here. So he said, don't, he said, leave it, leave everything, and let it be part of the story that, you know, God brought you from this place, um, 
and it's in yeah. his weak in your weakness that his strength is made perfect. So, so I was like, all right, you know, when Let's God taught me those two things, I was like, okay, no problem. Which leads me to the other story that I, I was originally going to tell you. So in the first, let's say, maybe six months or so, when I started teaching, you know, I, on average, I probably teach once a, a month. Um, and when I would teach, you know, you would cut little excerpts from the YouTube and put it on Instagram so yeah. that people can, you know, if it's small chops you want, at least collect the small <laughs> chop on Instagram. But if you want the full cost meal, go to the YouTube yeah. page, right? So I started posting, um, this is 2020 now. And one day, an egbon of mine, somebody who I had done a lot of business with, who had genuinely been a blessing to me, it opened doors for me, I would made a bit of money from just different things yeah. that we'd done. Um, so he calls me one day and he's like, Banky, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine, sir. He said, oh, I don't see all these things where you post, all this teaching where you teach for church. I love it. I think it's fantastic. It's great. It's great that you are, you know, you are strengthening your relationship with God. He said, but you know what? Don't post it online. Like, you can teach in church, do whatever yeah. you need to do, but don't post it online because you are a brand that um, corporates like doing business with because yeah. you are clean, there's no scandal. But you see, corporates don't like too much spiritual religion. religion. They don't, you know, companies don't want to, you know, they see that you're becoming too much of a pastor. They will appreciate you, but they won't work with you anymore. Yeah. And, 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 and he, wasn't, he wasn't lying. And he wasn't lying. Yeah. He wasn't lying. He was, he was saying it out from of genuine concern yeah. for me, somebody who had genuinely opened doors for me. And I said, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for the advice. And I hung up the phone and I was like, for a second, I was like, ah. Maybe, you know, this guy is not, he's not lying, right? He's telling he's the truth. truth. So maybe I should dial back online, just be teaching in church. But, you know, not so. But then I thought about it, and I thought about what God had done for me and where God had taken me from and how I was barely scratching the surface of where I know that he's taking me to. And it just, see, I only want the version of my life that is inside of God's will. I only want the kind of success that God wants for me. Wait, so, 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 if so, it's not that, you don't want then to. I'm wait, okay. Wait, wait, but see, I know when I sent you the name of the event, you said it was cheesy, he's got bankable. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been my own issue too. So I used to work for Budweiser. Yes. I used to work for MTV. Yes. So, and my clients are yeah. amazing guys, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what now? Yeah. Like, they're amazing guys, but yeah. they sell beer, they do. Yeah. And God said I should start posting Christian stuff. Yeah. My story too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, but there's no need. I yeah. have a church called the tribe. Yeah. I could do church quietly. Yeah. So my question is, as of now, and man to man, mm -hmm. has, has God added or taken from it? Has, has... Oh, he has added immeasurably. Oh, okay, well, not, how? Not, not just from a, a spiritual. spiritual standpoint, yeah. but also from success. See, you know, we used to run a record label. Yeah. Sometimes I run into artists and they're like, oh, Baba, sign me, you know, we can bring you a label. Yeah. And I'm like, my label closed in 2017. And in fact, in 2015, I told all the acts that we had at the time that, come, I only have a year or two of this left. So anything you need from me, take, take it now because I'm shutting down and I'm not, you know, I'm pivoting away. And that's the wisdom of God. So we, we've pivoted into a, a media agency. and marketing agency, yeah. which you know. Yeah. And quietly, we're working for some of the biggest multinational companies in Nigeria, quietly. We're doing marketing campaigns, we're doing uh, uh, advertising, we're doing activations, we're doing events, we're doing influencer management, we're doing bookings, we're doing... Go quietly, banking. like, it's not, there's no noise, you know, and we know who our corporate clients are, you know, I mean, I'm doing presentations, I'm doing pitches, you know, and and it's work that I genuinely enjoy, and the company is doing fantastic. In fact, we're doing the best, to God be the glory, as an agency, we're doing the best that we've ever done as a company. And then God has opened my eyes to other businesses. I co-own a restaurant now, Suya Bistro. We went from having one or two locations, now we have eight in Lagos. Wow. Um, and then just other things, like God has just opened doors that you don't even know are there but you have to be willing to trust him on that faith journey to say, I don't really know what the end of this road looks like, but I trust you enough to take the steps that I can see in front of me. 
and you know, and now, I'll let now, you sort it out. I'm going to ask a question, and I'm not judging okay. at all. Yeah. So I, I know Rema used to be in the church. He yeah. was a church dancer. Yeah. I know of Thames was a water book, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was a water book. When I was a water book, she was oh water. really? Yeah, she wasn't. Oh, I wasn't there at the time. Underground church. Okay. And I know a lot of. Um, I know Bonner Boys band are all like all church, church boys, boys gospel, yeah. and all that. Yeah. And I want to talk about those who are not called to do Christian music. Yes. But to to still be light in that space. Absolutely. Is that a thing? No question. So, you know... And so why did you, why didn't you do that? Why did you go from A well, to you know, B? For me, right, I'm in the phase of my journey where music is not my bread and butter. Okay. So it's not that I cannot or I ref, you know, I've dropped music entirely. It's just, you know, Dr. Dre. Yeah. Is he still in the music business? Yeah. Yes. Has he put out an album in no. 10 days? No. You know, there, there are people that they, they're just in the phase of their life where when they feel the inspiration is, is there to, to do it, they'll do something. But if they don't, they have enough. That's kind of the, 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 the era that I'm in now. So if I, you know, I put an EP out, not because I needed to drop an album, but because I just, there were some things that I wanted to say. Okay. Um, so I dropped an EP called The Bank Statement. So, back to what you were saying, I don't think that every Christian is a gospel singer. I also don't think that somebody who God has called to make gospel music should then turn around and give in to the temptation to do something else. God is very intentional about the callings and the seasons that he places on our lives. So, Peter, you are in Jerusalem. You are with the Jews. Paul... Your mission is to the Gentiles. It's not that you cannot, you know, crisscross, but this is what I've created you to do. Um, so, back to what you were saying, I, I genuinely believe that there is room for Christians who don't necessarily have the calling to do gospel music, to make music, just love music. Bro, when you were making your child with Madame, yeah. Were you praying? The more, that's were, you, were you playing? Uh, it you know, is well. It is well it with is. my soul. Were you playing? <laughs> we lift you high, Yahweh. What, you were, you were of not playing not. that. Because it was killer. You are well, You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, you know, you are, you are having a good time. <laughs> Guys, even the Bible, I mean, it's cliche, but read the songs of Solomon. Okay? The. <laughs> Song of Solomon, if you have not read it, I encourage you. There's it's wild. No, there's wild. no love song that has been as descriptive. The guy is talking about his honeymoon night. It takes him 11 verses before they even enter the matter. He's describing the eye, the, this part, the that part. The, listen. So, we, we make a mistake when we try to put God in a box that he did not put himself in. in. You know, I think that there's so much to this work with God. And sometimes in this almost like religious spirit, like religion is, is a dangerous thing, right? Where it becomes so restrictive and you must do this, you must not do that. You can't do this. It's dangerous. Can, it's too much. It's too much. And we put God in this box that he never intended to be in. So, yes, there is room for Christians to make not non-gospel music, but music that is entertaining, but edifying, but fun, that you can play, that is clean, you know, that, that doesn't make you feel like, you know, you're, you're driving the Holy Spirit out of you. But I think it's, it's very important, one, that people understand what their calling is um, and what your seasons are. So your purpose is permanent, right? And your purpose is probably much bigger than you realize. So the question is not even... What is my purpose? The question is, will I have enough time okay. to finish everything. everything that I could potentially do while I'm here? So purpose is massive, but callings are multiple. Purpose is permanent, callings are multiple. So David, right, his callings, he was a warrior, he was a, a musician. In fact, I think he was the greatest musician of all time because we Michael still... Michael Jackson. Sorry, we, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> we still... Wait, that, but, I mean, Michael Jackson is up there, but we... Thousands of years later, we use David's lyrics Sam, oh yeah, so to write songs. I hear you. I hear so you. what kind of musician are they quoting thousands of years? Anyway, after. 
<laughs> he's a king, he's a soldier, he's a musician, he's a priest, he's a prophet, he's a shepherd. These are all callings that have seasons to them. But when he dies, the Bible says, then David, after he had served the purpose of, of his, his generation, generation, he passed on. Served the purpose, not even fulfilled. Served. served the purpose. Do you know when the Bible talks about Joshua, it says, when Joshua died, it says, Joshua had not yet taken all, all the, the land, land that, was that God had yeah. pointed out to him. So you know what? So the question is, will I even have enough time to do, to do everything? There's something said about David. There's something you didn't say about David okay. in his callings. He wasn't a great father. He was a terrible so father. We'll, we'll go on a break, okay. and then we come yeah. to fatherhood. Let's do it. Is Bank a good father? Let's, Let's do it. Let's okay, do it. Let's it's full current. Thank you. And we're back to full current. Now, we... Oh yeah, clap, 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 man! Of course! Of course! So, we, um, we stopped at David. Yes. Being not a great father. Yes. And I have read... I'm a doctor by training, mm -hmm. and I read a book. I read, there's a guy you should read. His name is Gabor Mate. Find his book. Okay. Gabor Mate. Okay. He said that traumas are the good things that didn't happen for us, and the okay. bad things that happened to us, the consequences mm -hmm. of those things. Yes, okay. The good things that happened for us, and the, and the bad, bad things, things that happened to us. Now, if uh -huh. you read David's story, you can see that David was, didn't have a great father. He was, yeah. we don't even know if he was out of weird law. Yeah. We don't know that. Yeah. Did you have a great father, sincerely? Did I have a great father? Yeah. So, or let me say it again, you, the, the, did you and your father have a great relationship? Better? So my, my relationship with my dad has evolved okay. and has gotten better um, the older that I've gotten um, and the more that God has worked on you. both of us. Okay. But I will say this, do you know, and I stand to be corrected, but there are no examples of great fathers in the Bible. None. None. I stand to be corrected, but go and look it up and think about it. Was Abraham a great dad? No, he wasn't. He kicked his uh, baby mama with their <laughs> son out, you know. Was Moses a great dad? No. no. Left Zipporah. Left Zipporah and his family somewhere and said he's doing ministry. <laughs> then God said, oh, you are going to go and... You know there's a time in the Bible where God was going to kill Moses. Yeah. Moses, and Moses is writing about it, and he says, I was on the way, and God was waiting there to kill me because he was giving the law of circumcision to the nation, but he had not, but so what he was preaching to the he people, didn't he didn't do in his, in his own home. Was David, David was a terrible father, wow. right? Ter, ter, like, arguably one of the worst. Jacob left. <laughs> so there are no examples of great fathers in scripture. And there are examples of so many things in scripture. So God uses metaphors to describe things. So, you know, if he wants to talk about prosperity and flourishing, you say you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He says you want to talk about hard work, you know, be like the ant. You want to talk about not even worrying about tomorrow. He says, oh, the, the lilies of the field, they don't. But when he talks about fatherhood, God says, look at me. I'm the example of fatherhood. Because God loved his children so much that he was willing to give his life, For to them. take on human form. And Jesus was 100% God, but 100% man. And went through the pain of crucifixion to show you what a father's love really looks like. So we don't see that father's love, the, the pure... In man. In man, in scripture. What we see is sonship. When a son comes into the understanding of who God is, as a father is, and then walking in the fullness of sonship. And it is only when we become full, fully adjusted sons of God that we can then learn to be good fathers. And I think what, what you are saying about trauma is so true. So what you have, I mean, we had a, 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 a Brook Brothers meeting in Waterbrook where we got some of the guys together and we were just talking. And it was crazy how many guys were like, I've never heard my father say, I love you. My I father has. Now, now right? This is, yeah. We, but I'm why? I'm telling you. So many men were saying, I, some of them, you know, didn't even know who their dad was. The ones that did, didn't have any kind of fatherly love example. But if you check our father's generations. It was crazy. They were orphans. They were, you know, the, the father maybe never even came home. 
if he was there at all. My dad grew up as an orphan, lost both of his parents before he even knew who they were. Wow. So he was... He has no context. He has no context for parenthood. And at that time, our parents were thrown into marriage and parenthood at an even earlier age, right? So my mom, I think, was 23 when they got married. Me at 23. Do you know how much of a knucklehead <laughs> and how many issues that I had? You want to now saddle me with children? <laughs> so I think we, we, if we want to look for fatherhood, we have to look at God. And the example he laid through us, God the Father and through Jesus Christ and what he did. And that kind of sacrificial love. And it is from that relationship that we can understand this relationship. And, and, and not just even fatherhood, but even marriage. marriage. Right? Even marriage. Even trying to understand how to have a good marriage. So many of us, we either came from broken homes or homes that stayed together, but all we saw was pain and trauma, misery yeah. and trauma and domestic abuse and beating and verbal abuse and and, you know, male, and, and we, you know, we're talking in this Brook Brothers meeting and, you know, it's, it's a, a meeting of guys and, you know, it got to the point where guys were being very honest. And we're saying things like, man, from the marriage I saw my parents have, I don't want to get married. I mean, you're hearing guys talk, talk about this because of what they've seen. And, you know, what, what I was able to share with them was that sometimes what you've experienced what you've seen in your parents or did not see because they weren't even around, the negative experiences that you've been through or witnessed is, I mean, you can use it as a cage or you can use it as a lesson. You know, you can be a slave to it. You can be in the prison of that trauma or you can say, man, this thing has taught me that when I get married, this is what how I'm going to do it. And when, I'm, when I become a father, this is how I'm going to do it because I know what not to do. I know the damage that this thing has done to me. And the devil is so bad because he wants to pass that iniquity that was in your parents to you. down to you. So if a father struggled with promiscuity and women, check it. The sons may end up, and the On daughters may end up struggling with that too. If somebody struggled with whatever it is, okay, domestic violence, that behavior is learned. Crazy. You, you either you find children who've seen their, their dad beating their mom or their mom berating their dad or whatever, and you find that the children, a lot of times, the person who ends up exhibiting domestic violence is a behavior that was imprinted. So the devil wants to pass that iniquity down. It's scriptural. Abraham was with Sarah, his wife. He goes into uh, Egypt. He says, hey, hey, please, tell them you're my sister. You're not my wife. So he's lying about his wife. Years later, Isaac comes along, was not even around when, when that happened, does the exact same thing because the enemy wants to pass the demons that your parents struggled with down to you and saddle you in that same bondage because his job is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come so that we can have life. So the demons that I have battled, in Jesus' name, my son will not struggle with it. Amen. My son will not. It's, and it's my responsibility as, a, as an adjusted son of God, or at least a son of God who God is adjusting, to make sure that that iniquity ended in my generation. And my son will not struggle with pornography. My son will not be in Jesus' name. You know, and we all depend on the grace of God. It's not about our works. It's about the grace of God. But that's what this is about. The same thing goes with marriage, right? When, when we... We look at just how bad the divorce rate is, and sometimes the people that are even staying together are actually so miserable, and they're just it's staying together. Wild. They're staying together because what will people say, or are staying together for the children? You know, sometimes a marriage can be so bad that even the children will want the parents to split for so they can sake. have peace. But guess what? The pattern for what marriage is supposed to be is in the Bible. Question: When? First of all, we love Susu. Please clap, clap for Susu. Woohoo! That's you. my number one baby. Azaya is number two. Susu so, is number so one. We, with Susu, yeah. I think you, you, you guys had a miscarriage. Yes, we did. You had a miscarriage. Yes, we did. That means you've had battles already. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that you were prepared for marriage, sincerely? Were you prepared hmm. for marriage, Banky? I don't know that anybody 
who has entered into marriage can say, oh yes, I was 100% prepared for marriage. I think that at the point that you get married, the, the prayer is that you are at least in the place of intentionality about it. So you are not getting married because of peer pressure or because of family pressure or because you just feel like, ah, let me just have a wife. No, you, you are going into it with the right intentions. Now, going into the right intentions doesn't mean that you will get the execution perfectly Accurate. correct. No. You know, because we're all works in progress. And even for Christians, the truth is, salvation is an instant occurrence. The moment you decide to give your heart to Christ, salvation is instant. But sanctification a journey. is a journey. That's why the Bible says, you know, when you're born again, your spirit is reborn. But, renew your mind. but your soul, your mind, mind, your will, your emotions, your heart, it's, renewed. Is, it's being renewed. It, yeah. That's a process that is continuous. So when you want to talk about marriage, you have to, if you want to get it right, you have to look at it from the pattern of Scripture. Um, Bible says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. What that means in like broken down terms is that if you have a friend, Foy, and the friend says, maybe he has never been to church ever, doesn't know anything about Jesus, nothing, zero, just a blank slate. And the friend comes to you and says, Foy, okay, you keep telling me to come to church with you. You keep telling me to give my life to Christ. What does it mean? How is Jesus going to treat me? You, as a husband that's a child of God, should be able to tell your friend that, you know what? Jesus is going to treat you the way I treat my wife. That is how Jesus is going to treat you. That's deep. That's the standard of scripture. That's deep. On the flip side, the uh, Bible says, wives, That's deep. listen, the Bible <laughs> says, and these are lessons that God taught me. The Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands. First of all, when we talk about submission, because people's blood gets hot. Press your neck wait, 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 <laughs> first. First, the Bible says, submit yourselves one to another. Wonder. First, before it now starts saying, okay, husband, wife. <laughs> so even the husband, there's submission there. So let's, <laughs> let's leave that. But when the Bible says, wives, submit to your husband the way the, you know, the church is submissive to Christ. Flip, flip the situation in regular terms. Your wife has a friend doesn't have any frame of reference on God or a relationship with God. And the friend comes to your wife and says, okay, I'm, I'm thinking, considering this God thing, but how do I even talk to God? How do I, like, how do I relate? Your wife should be able to tell her that you see the way I relate with my husband. You see the way I talk to him. That's the way you relate to God. Tell me if we can genuinely live up to that standard would our marriages not be healed? Oh, God. Would they not be oh, healed? And Deep. people try to think that the Bible is outdated it's and not. it doesn't. See, the Bible is the word of God. It's his pattern for humanity. It's what you use to renew your mind. It's what you use to... See, we, we, all the experiences that we have in life, they're re rewiring our brains. You know what? So, because I, I want to stay here a bit. Okay, talk to me. With Susu. Yes. I'm, I'm be sincere. Now Talk she's a babe, she's a fine girl. Fine Yeah, she's everything. Too much. Come on, yeah, ga, 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 ga. speak it. No, 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 no. But was Susu... Yeah. Were you born again then? Yes, I was. Sincerely. Okay. But she was born again before you, of course. Well, yes, yes. Half and half. Let me explain. Okay. So, it's funny because people, you know, see me, you know, talking about God or teaching in church or at a conference or whatever. And they always give credit to Adesua they and do. say, you know, ah, you know, you brought your husband to, to God. To Christ, yes. See, Susu didn't bring me to Christ. <laughs> Christ brought, brought me to Adesua. <laughs> it was after I had found myself back in God and I was in an active relationship with God. Before Adesua, I had never had a relationship up to a year. I'd never been able to maintain Stay, with a woman, to be with a woman for up to a year. It was not even in the realm of possible. I think the longest official like, relationship that I had was maybe nine months, maybe. Wow. Trust issues. All kinds of trust issues. Porn, just partying, just life, you know. And so... 
I would never have even been able to get married if I didn't. That's why when the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, the problem that we have is sometimes we chase the relationship or we chase the money or the success or the career or anything that you are waiting on God for. Instead of just seeking God first, like for me, it was when I, when God brought me back in, it was like everything started to make sense. And that's not to say you don't have problems, because you do. You have plenty of problems. Jesus even tells you, in this world, you, you will have trouble. Shall. Say shall. You shall have so trouble. Shall means happen. It's going to happen. So, so, but yeah. when, you, when, you, when you sought that relationship it's first, it's, it's, that is when God will now open your eyes. The ironic thing was, until the day that I met Adesua, I'd met her three times before in the years prior. I didn't even notice. Maybe I noticed that, oh, there was a fine girl, but it didn't even register because I think God was intentionally blinding my eye that you're not going to come and mess this one up too. <laughs> so let me, let's work on us until I think it's even safe enough for me to consider giving her to you. And it was, when, it was now when I had, I mean, like I told you, I had kind of found my way back to God and I was on the journey with God and my relationship with Christ was important to me and I was, my spirituality now became the most important to me. It was then, this was the fourth time, but it was not later that she was telling me, do you remember so 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 place, so so, so, so yeah. She had interviewed me before for you, you didn't see I didn't see her. God is she, kind of. There's a picture where I'm standing with an artist that I, and so is holding a, a, a microphone for a, a TV session because she was on an internship for the summer or something. She'd come to Nigeria for the summer. She, she was working for a TV station. She's holding a microphone in front of me and another artist. <laughs> and there's a picture. And I don't even remember what was said in the interview. Wow. Talk less of the fact that I had met her. And that's what I mean about timing. Timing, see. The Bible says the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. But time and chance happen to everybody. But you know who stands outside of time and chance is God. And that's why the Bible also says everything will work together for your good. Because the one person who stands outside of time and stands outside of eternity and can make sure that even your mistakes will work together for your good and even your missteps and everything, your good times, your bad times, your trauma, your wins, Wait, your losses. So, so, you, so can you give an example where God used a bad thing that happened to you for, for your good? Is there any? Uh, you brought up one. In 2019, we had a miscarriage. Um, and we've shared this testimony online, so anybody who wants to watch it, just um, type Final Save Faith on YouTube, and you can hear this one and I talking about it. But we, you know, we had been trying to have a child. We, you know, it had been a few years, and you know, pressure. when you live your life in the public eye, that pressure is exponential. Where most people, that kind of pressure might come from your circle of friends. Man, people would slide into this was DMs and my DMs and, and tell her she's, ah, oh, you look at you, barren woman. You're eh? you are doing fine girl and you cannot, you're not even a real woman. They would slide into my DMs and tell me, look at you, impotent man. You know, you cannot even have a child. Your mates are having baby mamas all over the place. You cannot even impregnate your, they would say the vilest, meanest, most wicked things. Not knowing that even you, you're already under pressure yourself because you want, you genuinely want, I was ready to be a father before I was ready, at least I thought I was ready to be a father, before I was ready to be a husband. I wanted kids from time. I, I, I had even told myself that since relationships were not working out for me, when I got to 40 years old, if I was not married, I will just go and find one fine girl with a good background, we'll have a discussion, and I'll say, have a baby with me, then give me the baby and go, so that I can because I really wanted kids. So imagine that kind of pressure. And then you're opening, and social media has given so much access. Wild. So you're seeing the meanest, just vile, vitriol, like people say the most, and you know, it comes from a place of the bitterness and the pain that people are yeah. feeling. Yeah. So because, say misery loves company, because you are, you are, maybe you're not happy with how your life looks currently, you want to project that pain onto whatever is an easy target. So we're there, we, you know, we, so we started trying to do IVF. We tried IVF three times. One of those times, we actually got pregnant with twins. 
and then we lost them. And I tell you, this was now, and this was 2019, I had lost the election. We, we now lost twins. It was, such, it was such a painful time for us as a couple, for us as individuals. You're just dealing with loss Wait. and weight. And, and you're a Christian then. And you're a Christian. But, but you, you know what, practically, how did you call us? What, what, what did you do? That's one practical thing you did. So, so this is what it is for me. And it, it's, not, <laughs> it's not easy as saying, you know, f flip a light switch, right? If you, Pity gave me this example years ago. And he said, if you think about a triangle, right? Just think about a triangle. So there's a, you know, the top, this end and this end, right? Imagine your wife is here and you are here. And you're trying to make this work. But in between, there's trauma, there's baggage, there's past relationships, there's attitude, there's pride, there's ego. There's so many things that make this impossible. He said, but if both of you start trying to draw closer to the dot, invariably, what happens? You can't close You're getting closer together. So it is by keeping God at the center of the relationship, even in those storms, it's like building your house on a rock. The winds are going to come. The storms are going to blow. And we went through, 2019 was a tough, this period was a difficult, difficult time for us as a couple. But somehow, God kept us together. And God helped us process the pain and process the trauma. And prior to that, I didn't think that we could be closer than we were. But after this 20, it's, it's after 29, it's 2020 that I started preaching in church. So God used that, that period, and not just the miscarriage, but everything. So all we the losses, all, we, we, were, we went through a lot. We went through a lot. But God used that to draw us. Closer. So I personally don't believe that God inflicts pain on us. But all things work together. But all things work together. God doesn't inflict pain, but he will use it to, to build your character, to show you things about yourself, to teach you things that you, you are not seeing, um, and really to prepare you for where he's trying to take you to. Great destinies require great character, but character cannot be prayed into you. Character can only be built Thank by you what you much. go through. One thing I would, I watched the, I watched your, no, I think your most, one of the recent sermons when yeah. you spoke about porn in church. Yeah, yeah. The water broke, I watched yeah. it. Yeah. That goes, I had bought you that morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Before we go on the next break, okay. five minutes, okay. I want you to talk to husbands mm. that are battling porn in mind, because a lot of men are doing it. A lot of men are yeah. battling a lot yeah, of yeah, men. Yeah, 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 yeah. Battling. Ah, okay. And the, the weights, because a lot of people are carrying yeah. weights. Their, their wives don't satisfy them at all. Right, right. Let, I know, I have friends that their wives, they just do it so that they're married. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they get pleasure from, from and, it started at 13, at yeah. 12. Yeah. I schooled in Casey. I worked from at 13. Yeah. So now imagine kids that have phones. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wild. The access is insane. It's, it's, and it's it wrecks marriages. It, it wrecks intimacy. So yeah. speak to that for five minutes. Okay. Place. So this is the kind of topic that is very hard to speak to in five minutes. So I will start by saying if you are a husband um, or a wife, if you are a couple out there that is dealing with this, there's help available. You can even start with the message that I did. Yeah. So I, it's I, on YouTube. I, it's on YouTube. It's called The Prison of Pornography. Of pornography yeah. And it's on my YouTube page. So I want to plead with you. To check if it you out. see this, go and watch it. Because I, I get into it in detail. Um, but to try and you know, draw out a couple of things yeah. about it. The most dangerous thing with porn is that it rewires your brain. So what it does is it teaches your brain that this is what pleasure is. It's, it's slowly but surely, it starts to make you think that, because you know, with porn, your, your standards of beauty change, it's this fake Quick thing. Quick fixes. It's, you can watch a different girl every 10 seconds, you, you know, and your, your brain is, is feeding on this, and it's feeding on this, and it's feeding on this. It's like a computer that a virus has entered, and eventually the virus takes over the entire system. So it's rewiring your brain. This is actually the same problem with premarital sex. The, the, um, 
rewiring of your the brain, highs. the high of it, the thrill of it, where it is the illicit sneaking around, hiding in the bathroom to watch porn, or you're going to a girl's house overnight and leaving for your walk of shame before the morning. What you don't realize, the danger is that you're teaching your brain, you're teaching your brain that this is what I like. I know it's wrong, but I like it. I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm enjoying it. So your brain is, is feeding on this, and it's feeding on this. And then what happens? You think, oh, I'm going to get into a marriage, and, and I'll just stop watching porn. No, because now you're having the most guilt-free, the only guilt-free sex you've ever had in is your it, life. Yeah. It's available. Your wife is there for you, and you genuinely love your wife. But you've taught your brain that I need to see a different woman every, every 10, 10 seconds, seconds on my computer screen. So it's not even about physical contact. It's, it's chemical. It's chemical. It's in your Biology. mind. You know? So, so now you're married, and you're genuinely in love, and you're happy. But your brain wants what it wants. So your brain starts telling you, no, this isn't pleasure. The pornography is. The videos, that's what I need to see. And you ever wonder why, and I'm not, I don't say this, please, I hope people hear my heart and they don't take one, and that's why I say I want people to watch the whole message, yeah. because people this age, people take little clips and then they'll say you're talking about something else Ooh. or whatever, so please hear my heart, and please go and watch the whole message. So what you need to do is to now rewire your brain again, and that is a process that, as far as I know, can only be done by God. By God, with the word of God. You need to now start feeding your heart, your soul, your with emotions the word. with the word. That's the only thing and that can it is a regimen reprogram discipline. See, there are so many things that we need to talk about, and that's why I don't like answering these questions in, in short form. Bits. One, you need to be on an active pursuit of God. Two, you need to understand that you have to set up boundaries for triggers, right? It's easier to flee temptation than it is to fight it. So, there are some people that, they may even be your friends, but you know that they are going to post certain... Block. There are some of my, my, they are my guys who... But you are blocked. They are friends of mine. But I don't, I don't block because they will now say, you block but me you or mute. you followed me. I mute. Thank God. <laughs> you <I> mute <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram. I mute, I restrict. So, I don't even see... You know what? We have to go on a break. This is what I'm saying. Now, you cannot <laughs> make me answer this and then <laughs> stop. Let me, let me say one more thing. Okay, one more thing. One let more me thing. say one more thing yeah. and then we'll stop. I'm sorry. <laughs> let me say one more thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Jesus tells a story. He says, when an evil spirit leaves a man, yeah. it's, it's, you know, roams around looking for where, and then it says, I'm going back to the house from whence I came. And, I, and he finds the house swept, put in order, and empty. And then he brings seven more spirits, more wicked than himself, and they say they go and occupy, and they, the state of that man is worse. So to make it very simple, these sexual issues with especially pornography is dangerous because what will happen is you think you can fight it in your own will, but pornography brings with it shame, it brings lies, guilt. it brings guilt, it brings so many other things that seek to hold you in bondage. The key word for me, and when I found this, it blew my mind, he said, the spirit finds the house empty, swept, I mean, yes, um, swept, put in order, and empty. Swept means cleaned, right? So the blood of Jesus washes us clean. Clean, yeah. Put in order means God reorders your priorities. So you start knowing what's important. But the key word is empty. You can't leave the house empty. empty. The, what you now need to do is fill the house with the word of God. The Bible says when the enemy pursuit. comes in like a flood, the spirit of God raises a standard against him. That standard only comes by feasting on the word of God. You watch, I mean, I watch messages, <laughs> relig like, if I find a sermon I like, if I don't watch it at all, I watch it five times. Wow. I am, I, I'm in reading books, I'm watching messages, not just about porn or what, I'm just talking you're about keeping, life. You're keeping your, your, your... I'm trying to feel myself because the devil doesn't give up. Oh. He may take some time and say, let me, and it may, for you it may not be porn, it may be greed, it may be money, it may be, Bitterness, it may be anger, it may be rage. It may, there's so many things that we battle with. But the only weapon that I know is that word of God. And the more you fill yourself with that, the more the Spirit of God is able to bring that word to your remembrance and use that as a standard against what the devil wants. I'm sorry, I went over my time. So we go, we'll, but it was we'll go for a break and then we'll come back. Okay. Please, it's full current. Thank you.
Now we're back to a full car and make some noise for our Woohoo! <laughs> so I started with the show with my poetry. I said from a to a Tiosa. The Bank has done it all. Thank you. So you, I, I can be with friends. So you know I can come to the place. Okay, you yeah. Is so now you prepare me so that you can take I a shot. Too hard. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Is your political yeah. adventure just being a responsible Nigerian? Mm. Or did you hear God? So the thing about first of all, it's not just being a responsible Nigerian, although that is very important. That is important. The thing about walking with God is that God never shows you the full picture. But he always gives you enough and tells you enough to take the next step. And it is in taking that step that he will start to order your steps and redirect you and detour you. So when something doesn't work, and this is not just about politics, this is for anybody who's doing anything. If something doesn't necessarily work out, don't necessarily assume that you have stepped outside of God's will. If you look, again, we look at scripture as our pattern, right? Joseph had a destiny as, you know, essentially one of the most powerful people in the world. But look at the journey that God allowed him to go through and the tribulation. Anybody who looked at him in the pit or the prison or in Potiphar's house would have said, hey, yeah, you know, God has abandoned this one. But when you check scripture, it says at every point, it says the Lord was with him. Because Joseph was obedient. Joseph was passing through the tests that God was putting him through for what he was preparing him for. And so for me and politics, the truth is, I believe very strongly that my part of my purpose is leadership. Part of my purpose is government. I believe it very strongly. I feel a burden for it. And those, that kind of burden doesn't come from ambition. ambition. In fact, the journey takes so much from you that you will sometimes question if it's even worth it, what the, the price that you have to pay, financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually, just what you go through to, to toe this kind of line and what you go through in the public eye, you sometimes have moments where you're just like, ah, but I'm okay, I should be, I can just, you know, um, but again, this is about meaning, this is about purpose, this is about what you were created to do and understanding times and seasons and where you're at in your life and the calling of God on your life in that time. And it's our responsibility to plan. It's God's responsibility to order our steps, right? So you make plans. You know, the Bible says in Second Thessalonians, may you live a life worthy of his calling and have the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. And when you unpack this, it actually says God prepared things, good things for you to do before the foundation of the world. So before you even came here, God had a plan in mind and a purpose that you for it were going to live in. And he now puts faith inside of you to prompt you to say, for it, but should be your media. You can do this full current. Start something. Start something. Start something. Take a step. Take a step. And it may not necessarily look like what it does in your mind right now but it doesn't mean that it will not get there. When God anointed David, king of Israel. Four times before he became king. <laughs> yeah, he didn't count the times. How many years was it Ten. from his teenage years to when he got into his 30s? When he found, and in that time, there was a time that he had to pretend like a madman and allow <laughs> saliva to drop down his and be eating grass. Somebody who saw that, would they think that this is going to be the greatest king in his, Israel's history? Or Joseph that was telling you that I will rule. Joseph that was telling you. So we, we sometimes think that our purpose is a straight line. It's not. It's a maze. It's a map that only God knows oh, the route. So your job is to, whatever your faith prompts you to do, whatever the faith that you have in God that, has, that he has put inside of you, whatever that prompting is, you make a plan. So faith plans, I learned this from Dr. Hart Ramsey, he's a teacher that I listen to all the time. Faith plans, faith prompts, so your faith will prompt you. Faith plans, you, you have to have a plan from whatever you're feeling prompted to do, you put a plan in place. Faith prays, if your faith does not pray, it's not faith. 
So you have to pray, you have to talk to God about it. And then faith pursues. So you pursue. And in doing that, it's God's... The Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. So, but it's easier to redirect something that is already in motion than to... God's not going to drag you from your house and say, oh yeah, come and do a TV show or run for office or do whatever. No. You in your house will say, okay, I feel like God is telling me to do this. This is what I think I should do. And you start taking those steps. And as you do it, even if you hit a roadblock, you know what you say? You say, ah, now I know God is redirecting me. God is detouring me. God is ordering my steps, steps. for where he wants me to be and how he wants me to be. So, Sometimes, eh? So we'll take a break. Ah. <laughs> okay. We'll take a break and then we come back. Okay. No, wait, hold that thought. This one, I, this one was a short thing. I didn't know about to break. Okay. Now. No problem. But take it in Full current. Thank, thank you, thank you again. Thank you very much. So we're back. We're back. We're, we're back. back. We're back. As we close out this session yeah. in about 10, 15 minutes. Okay. My next question are like personal questions. Okay. Yeah. And the there have all been personal questions, Dr. Foy. Personal, personal. <laughs> there are people that have been Christians. Uh -huh. And it's like God hasn't come through for them. And mm -hmm. I know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's like God hasn't come through for them. Mm -hmm. They some haven't had kids for 12 years. Mm -hmm. I know a friend who has had kids for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Real stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, know, I know of PJ, lost his parents. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've had some. Yeah, tough. people have had some tough, tough situations. Situations. Yeah, really tough. And yeah, do you have do you have words? I won't say that I can heal them, but words that you've you have gone through that you want to share about where it does where it doesn't yeah. seem that God is bankable. And I, 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 and yeah. I, I, I sound. Tentative, but I know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, I will, I will try to share maybe two or three things that yeah. I've learned. Okay. The first is that the reality is that our time here on earth is a small fraction of our eternity. Yeah. And there's no way to even try to fathom life if you remove the eternity part Path of the of equation. Eternity. So what really what we're doing right now is sowing seeds for what we will reap in eternity. Um, so even things like death, as difficult and as hard as they are, what we understand is that death is not death, it's a transition. And so for those who've lost someone as I mean and that's hard it's and we're hard. not we're not um, demeaning that or belittling that in any way shape or form but it's a transition and I think the more that you trust in God and 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 open your heart up to that reality um, that at the end of the day we're spirits we're just in this body for a time and eventually sooner or later we're all going to lay this body down and transition to a different place so I think that helps having that eternal perspective helps secondly for people who are waiting on god for something that it seems like he hasn't done using you know our our little journey and struggle with trying to have a child that we have now i had we had to learn that faith is complete trust in the giver not in the gift or the timing of the gift and this is a very difficult thing for people to understand. And it was difficult for us. But we had to get to the point where, I mean, three failed IVFs, one miscarriage, we lost twins. I mean, we went through it in, in the years that we were waiting. And then I remember this same, after 2019, that same January of 2020, I just called to, to, to the side one day. I said, babe, we're not doing anything again. I said, let's just go back to the place of reckless abandon and trust in God. I said, we may get pregnant next week. We may get pregnant. I literally told her, I said, we may get pregnant next week, next month, next year, 10 years from now, or never. 
And yeah. maybe it, I said it, and I said, if it is God's will for us to go out and adopt a child, we will go and adopt a child, and we will be fine, and it will be the most beautiful baby that we can ever imagine. I said, we need to get back to the place where we trust God fully and completely, and whatever happens, it's okay. though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Sometimes, as Christians, we need to, you know, we, see, we sing songs like, we give the sacrifice of praise. But it sounds nice, right? But praise sometimes is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice costs you something. It's born out of a place of giving up something. It can be painful. And you have to be able to praise God in the middle of that. I said, if we never have a child, I will still love you till my dying day. We will go out. There are so many babies that don't have homes. Maybe that's the story. Maybe that's what I said, I don't know what God wants to do. But whatever his plan is for us, that's what we want for ourselves. And we said, we're not the IVF clinic, God bless them. Amazing people. They called us. They said, oh, do you want to come? We know that it hasn't worked, but we can. We said, thank you very much. They said, ah, you know, they not, they will not, and that's when the devil now start telling you things. Oh, you know, you're aging. You're getting a certain age. You may not be able to do this. You may not be. We said, thank you very much. But we're okay. And I, we just felt, and, and she confirmed it as well, we just felt like, let's just go back to loving ourselves and loving God and praising God. And it was when we got to that place of reckless abandon, of love and trust in God, that the pregnancy happened like that. Naturally, no procedure, no IV, nothing. Just God was, it was almost like God was waiting for us to stop trying to dictate to him what to do and when to do it. And when you're in the middle of that waiting season, it can be very difficult. And what, can, and what we need to now guard against as children of God is that we don't put something on the throne of our hearts. You know, the Bible talks a lot about idolatry, right? It's, it's in the Ten Commandments. We know that God does not play with idolatry. But we think of idols as carved images that people will make and go and bow down and do sacrifices in the mountain or the river too. Anything can be an idol. Anything that takes that place of prominence in your heart can be an idol. It can even be a good thing like a child or a relationship or your like business career. or career or money. It can be your phone. Most of us, we don't realize that our phones have become idols. We wake up in the morning, the first thing we do, open Instagram, open TikTok, open Snapchat, open... Twitter and or e email work like we've we've created these idols that have taken that place of prominence in our hearts. So I, and I was talking to a lady. Um, I had spoken somewhere. And she asked me this question that she's in the waiting season. That can I tell her anything that can encourage her? I said, my sister, I know this is very difficult. Remove that baby from that place of idolatry in your heart where you are so obsessed with it. Every month that your period comes, you have gone into depression, you are crying. She started laughing because I was because we'd been there. Every month that we realized that we were not pregnant, we would my, my wife would be upset. You know, it should be it's tough. But the day that we said, God, see, eh, whatever your version of life is for us, that's what we want, and we are fine. And we will praise you anyway, and we will love you anyway and we will serve you anyway, and we will give to you anyway, and we are okay, and we are going to, we just, it was like we just took it and just put it somewhere. My brother, we were sitting there watching Friends one day, and this is in the testimony, we are watching Friends, the TV show Friends, you know, we are sitting at home, we are watching it, and I felt like I just had this notch, because you know the Holy Spirit speaks to you in thoughts, and on the TV, it was like Monica and Chandler, and Monica was like, I'm ovulating, let's go. And they go into the room to go and have sex. And I was like, I just had this thought, like, do you guys have any ovulation test kits? And I was like, babe, do you have, they have ovulation test kits? She's like, yeah, I have. I said, do you have any? She said, no. I said, can we get? She said, yeah, I'm sure they sell it in the pharmacy. I said, I feel like, you know, maybe, maybe this is God saying, you know. So we went and bought the ovulation test kit. You know, when around the time she was supposed to be ovulating, she tested Nothing. No smiley. Tested the next day. No smiley. Now, the third day, night, it was like midnight. She tested again. We saw the smiley face. 
Oh, but that was the green light. Over the next 48 hours. <laughs> oh, law. <laughs> Do you understand? Law. But, guess what? This sequence of events, you can look at it and think coincidence. I look at it and I see the hand God. of God. Friends. Because it's friends. friends. And if we were just using normal calculation, right, in the three days that we thought she was ovulating, we would have been having sex then. And would have said, oh, yes. here comes. But guess what? That's why a, a, see, Christianity is not a, rel a religion. It's a relationship. It's about having a personal relationship and communication with God. And the Holy Spirit speaks to you in thoughts, in dreams, in visions. He speaks in so many ways. And it was in that. But prior to that, remember what I said? Susu had done hallelujah challenge. We had praised God. We, had, we were in a place of reckless about like God, see, whatever, it's okay. And then in the moment, God says, go get an ovulation test kit. And we get it. And then we have sex. And the next month, we're in the bathroom. She's sitting and she does the pregnancy test. And she says, Olubankoli, Jesus has done it. <laughs> and my brother, that's a good place to praise God. <laughs> so, if I could wrap up everything, because I know we're close yeah. to ending now. Can I see the producer smiling? <laughs> if I could wrap up everything that we've said today and everything that my life has turned out to be in one thing, if you take anything away from me, seek first the kingdom of so God. So God is bankable, for real. God is bank. See, sort God out. Do this. If you focus on this first, Everything else that you're worrying about like this, eventually, there's a reason the cross is like this. <laughs> do this one. Wow. If you do this, all of this eventually will make sense. It may not be when you want it, how you want it, how you pictured it to be, but God's plan for your life is better than anything that you could dream for yourself. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts for us is so much better, but you have to be able to trust him and love him and allow submit to what he wants for you and if you do that eventually invariably eventually inevitably everything will make sense so 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 we put in about three minutes okay and and you've you, you've you, you've done movies you've done yeah you're gonna do a movie very soon yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they're not christian some are christian movies some are not christian movies you, yeah. you, you 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 impact culture you influence culture and all that mm -hmm. for those people who love God, mm -hmm. want to just love God. Mm -hmm. But when you say, seek first the kingdom, mm -hmm. does it mean work for church? Does it mean... No. no. Get, like, so no. Kingdom, what does it mean? Church is a part of kingdom. Yeah. Excuse me. Is it like just be an usher in church, security pool? What, what and that mean? may be part of part what of your yeah. service to God yeah. is. But, but Jesus said, you are the light of the world. world the salt of, of the, the earth. earth. He didn't say you are the light of the church. church okay. The problem with us in church is that we've turned it into this thing where we come into the four walls of the church and I blind you with my light, you blind me with my and we speak in tongues <laughs> and we pray and we bah, and that's where it ends. Yeah. See, this thing is about dominion. Before salvation came into the picture in Genesis 3, God had already spoken kingdom. In Genesis 1, One. when he said I've made man and woman be fruitful, multiply, have take dominion, take control over the resources. We, there's something called the seven mountains of influence, politics, media, entertainment, business, family. We are supposed to be the light in all of these places. The, the job responsibility of light is to dispel darkness. And we make a mistake, you know, as children of God, where we think, we only walk within, and that's not to say church is not important. Is I it, serve in church. Yeah, of course. So I'm not in any way saying that you need it. And the Bible says don't forsake the assembly. You um, can't take one and leave the other. No. It all works together, right? So, yes, serve in church. Absolutely. Give, serve, you know, do that. But then where has God placed you? What industry, what office, what school, what company, what family? You are the Jesus that the people in your office or your family or your neighborhood they may be the only Jesus that they will ever see. So your job is to be the light in that field. Sometimes you get into a, a room full of people, or, you know, in a church, and people come in with the mindset that it is the person that holds the microphone 
that is the minister. It's not true. The Bible says Jesus gave gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. <laughs> so, church is supposed to be like boot camp. Like a training Finish field. Station. It's where you come, you get refilled, you get trained, you pick up tools. Why? Because there's a war going on outside that you have to fight. There's a, there's a world that you have to influence. So I have to be relevant in the filmmaking space. And to the glory of God, whether through EME agency or through Bad Productions, Adeswa's company, and Adeswa and I's um, film production company, some of the most successful films in Nollywood history are films that we're executive producers on. You don't always, I'm, me, I like to be in the background. I like to fund, invest, the help the film come together, but I don't, you know, it's only once in a while I'll act. But she will get in front of the camera, and we've had an amazing success story in films, in investing in films and telling the story of Nigeria and our culture and our tourism and our people and everything that makes us special through films. We've done the same thing through music. We're doing it through food. People are doing it through fashion. The shirt I'm wearing is a Nigerian designer. The jacket is a Nigerian designer. This is my atafo. This is GERD. I'm trying to get to the point where everything that I wear is Nigeria. Head to toe is either Nigerian or African. Why? Because the world is not going to come and tell our stories for us. We have to get to the point where we believe in what God has created us to be, to invest in it, to showcase that, to broadcast that to the world. So when I'm in the film business, I'm, my job is to be the light in that business. If I'm in music, if I'm in the advertising so agency space, everywhere. if I'm in food, if I'm in a business, an entrepreneur, real estate, if I'm in politics, my job is to be the light in that field. You think God doesn't want Christians in political parties? He does. You really think so? <laughs> you really, you re First of all, you think one party is good and every party that is not... <laughs> is there any church that you can vouch 100% for every member of, of the church. Of course not. It's not our job to defend our political past. It is our job to redefine the future. It's exactly. our job to say we can do this thing better. So wherever you find yourself in a political party, in a government office, in a company, in a school, in a family, in a neighborhood, in a country, your job is to go there and stay plugged into your source. Because if I unplug this light now, it's useless. So it's you stay low. plugged into the source. But you be the light in whatever darkness that you are facing. And when we do that, this world will change. Incredible. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure. It's, it's full current. It's holistic conversation. It's, imagine you have light and it's half current. You Come, on charge full Come on now. Come on. Is it microwave set? No, go walk. walk. You can't watch the Arsenal match. Beat Arsenal beat Man United next full week. Current, you need full current, Baba. You need full current to do it. Thank you so much, guys. It's a pleasure. See you next Sunday on Full Current. Put your hands together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.